Welcome, I'm Maureen Connolly, the Editor-in-Chief of EverydayHealth.com and the host of Boxed In, a series from Everyday Health featuring conversations with the country's top mental health experts focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on our mental health and well-being. So today we have Dr. Phyllis Z joining us. Dr. Z is the Benjamin Virginia T. Bosch's Professor in Neurology, the Director of the Center of Circadian and Sleep Medicine, and the Chief of the Division of Sleep Medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University, Chicago. A little later in this conversation, we'll also hear from Dana Sullivan. And Dana describes herself as being a chronic but undiagnosed insomniac. The COVID-19 pandemic is making sleep all the more difficult. So to start, Dr. Z, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. So we all know sleep is important, um, but I don't think people realize how big a role sleep plays in immune health. That's especially important right now in light of the pandemic. So can you speak to the connection between the two? Absolutely. There's really a wonderful amount of data that is just evolving on the importance of sleep for immunity. And that is really something that's really ability to protect you from infections but also to keep you, to keep your immune system in a very resilient uh, place so that you are able to fight infections. So for example, if uh, many of us had the flu vaccine and uh, we know that in healthy individuals who are sleep deprived, that they're after the flu vaccine, they're not able to mount that antibody response that you normally would expect for about a week. So it's really delayed compared to those who were able to get a good night's sleep right after they were able to get the vaccine. Okay, so in, in terms of um, just general immunity, I love that uh, being able to understand it by way of the flu vaccine and what it does, but um, you know, you go to bed, um, there are different cycles of sleep, which I could you know get into right now, but I know we only have a short amount of time, but um, like what in a, in a night's sleep is actually helping us to be more resilient or helping our immunity? Like what is the brain doing the work, the body and what happens? Well, it's during sleep, especially during deep sleep or what we call slow wave sleep when those brain waves are very, very slow. That appears to be not only immunologically important but also very important for metabolism, for, for your neurons and your brain to metabolism. So your brain, it is, it is, your sleep is in your brain, but it's affecting the entire body. So it is affecting the immune system, not just in the brain, but it's through its hormonal and perhaps other pathways. It's affecting the, the regulation of the immune system in all parts of the body and all tissues of the body. So when um, we do things to interfere with sleep or we have things like a pandemic and the amount of stress and anxiety that are keeping us, a lot of people, millions of people, I would um, guess, from having good quality sleep, right? Either they're staying up too late or they're having interrupted sleep. What happens that's detrimental to us? So when, you, when there's anxiety and when there's stress, that itself increases what we call the cortisol levels, that's your fight and flight uh, hormone. And that hormone actually also decreases your ability to fight off infections. Acutely, it's important because it kind of keeps your immune system wrapped up, but on a chronic basis, it can actually affect your ability to fight off infections. So not only is the anxiety and the stress causing problems with your sleep, which in itself is very useful and helpful for fighting off infections. Now on top of that, stress itself can directly impact your ability or your immune system. Okay, and then outside of the immune system, what are the other impacts you know, that you're seeing right now uh, in light of the pandemic when people are, you know, are not sleeping well? And I mean, I would venture to say, obviously like a lack of focus the next day. Um, what other problems are cropping up around this? Well, sleep has so many important um, consequences and uh, for, for health. One of them is metabolism. So people are saying, ooh, you know, at least in my social media um, area, they're like, ooh, I think I've gained, I'm gaining a lot of weight uh, during this uh, pandemic. And partially it's because they may be eating more. There's food is more available, perhaps at least for some people. But also, when you don't sleep, you're not able to utilize 
the, the sugars, the glucose, the nutrients that you are ingesting. So it's affecting metabolism. And we know that lack of sleep and or mistimed sleep can increase weight, can uh, increase your ability. For example, if you are already overweight, that may be an issue with diabetes. It increases the risk for diabetes and also affects your ability for your blood pressure is changing with that. So sleep has really broad effects on your cardiovascular system, your metabolic system, and of course, very importantly here, your immune system. So um, as a sleep expert, what are your biggest concerns right now for, I guess, all Americans, but like your friends, family, you know, what are your, what are you saying to them? What advice are you giving them? I, I'm concerned about the lack of structure that um, this pandemic is bringing in, especially when we're sheltering at home. And structure is really important. So I keep advising my friends and of course my patients who we are now seeing remotely is to maintain a regular structure. I know we're home, uh, but it's really important to maintain a regular structure. Don't go to bed much later or much earlier than you typically do by let's say an hour or two. What we don't want to get into the situation is the social jet lag, right? And social jet lag is like this variability from day to day of when you go to bed, when you wake up. That's really important for maintaining good sleep health. What is the connection? It's just your body gets into a rhythm and knows what to do better than if you do it at different times? It's important because your body actually has its own rhythm and it's a biological rhythm. And this is actually regulated fantastically at a genetic or molecular. So every cell of your body has a rhythm. And that rhythm is in, in synchrony with that of the rotation of the earth, right, on its axis. So this is day night rhythm. And so we have our own intrinsic rhythm. When we mess that up, it messes up sleep. But not only does it mess up sleep or the quality of sleep, it also messes up your metabolism, your immune function, uh, et cetera. So I really think it's important to maintain that regularity, not only regularity in sleep and awake time, but also in what, when you're eating, keep your meals about the same. Exercise, continue to exercise, albeit at a, at a less intense level, but maintain the timing of, of exercise. And for that matter, maintain the timing of your social media, of your social interactions, because all of those are what we call time givers. They give timing information to your brain, to the rest of your body with regards to how you are in synchrony with the external environment as well. And I think that's what we tend to lose with sheltering at home and during this pandemic. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely challenging, right? When you can't get to the gym or you're trying to exercise in front of, you know, your computer for the, like the 40th day in a row, it kind of, you know, I could see how people, um, it's, it's just super challenging. Um, so question around alcohol. Uh, I hear, you know, a lot of people I know are, um, I don't know that they're consuming more alcohol. Maybe some people are, but even alcohol in general, a glass of wine or two, um, you know, in the evening, how, What's, what's your opinion around that? Like, don't go there, it's bad for sleep, or depending on your age, it's bad for sleep? Well, it does depend a bit on your age, but in general, I think it is, it, these are hard times, and if you have a glass of wine with dinner, I think that's perfectly acceptable. Now, three or four glasses may not be acceptable. Uh, the, I think the other thing about drinking and even eating is I recommend that we stop drinking or eating, especially drinking alcohol, within three hours of bedtime. So maintaining that regular bedtime and keeping that, con that, that relationship of timing between your bedtime, your eating, and also, of course, your alcohol consumption. So I think as long as you're doing in very in moderation, one or two glasses, I think that's acceptable. Okay, and then um, in terms of computers is it the hour is that the rule shut down like you know get off your instagram and your phone and whatever else computer you're looking at even tv i mean is is there some window is it an hour should be more yeah at least an hour i would say at least an hour to really be allow yourself time to just wind down i also think part of the anxiety certainly what i'm experiencing is watching the news over and over again 
about the number of deaths. Uh, and this is really important. So I, what I've done for myself and I recommend to my patients is that just watch the news about that at the end of the day and don't keep watching it over and over again or getting that into the bedtime. So one to two hours before bedtime you should dim down your lights, do the relaxing procedures, and, um, and then when you do get in bed, certainly do not take your phone with you. Check your phone for the last events that you need to check about an hour before you go to bed. Now, there are people who don't have any trouble with their sleep. So they, they will say, well, that doesn't work for, it doesn't matter. Okay, great for you. But for those especially who are more vulnerable, for example, to anxiety, who have insomnia already, it is extremely important to be mindful of the light at night, when you eat, how much light you get during the day. That's what we didn't talk about. It's great to get that morning light. That is gonna keep your clock, your internal clock and your sleep in a better shape. Okay, and have you heard of the, a new website that's dedicated to COVID dreams? You can actually go there and read about people. They're, they're saying they're having weirder dreams or more memorable dreams during COVID. Yes, I've, I've heard about that. I've also seen that on, on, uh, on the news and television. And I think that, you know, dreams are, you know, I'm not a dream expert, but I, I believe dreams occurring during what we call rapid eye movement sleep, they are in some ways manifestations of our experiences during the day. And they, these memories of what's happening during the day, our emotional memories, our visual uh, memories, they all get uh, in, in some way um, filtered uh, in, you know, during sleep. And I, so I'm not surprised that people are having more, I would say, disturbing dreams or dreams are related to the pandemic, such as you know, getting an infection, for example, or having you know, not being able to breathe. I think those are experiences during that. That's why I think it's really important to maintain your regular schedule, to take time during the day to kind of debrief yourself. And I think mindfulness therapy, where you uh, just are mindful of your anxiety, you're mindful that you are being, that you're stressed and take deep breathing and or exercise. Uh, those taking time out during the day for yourself is very important because you don't want to carry that into the night, into, into sleep, because that will disturb your sleep. Yeah, well, this might be a nice time to introduce our guest, Dana Sullivan. Um, as we kind of started this conversation off, she you know, says she thinks she's an undiagnosed insomnia, uh, and COVID hasn't helped the situation <laughs> even, you know, at all. So um, maybe this, uh, Dana, thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, really interesting conversation, and the the one thing that I I, re I recognize that I do a lot of things well, and then some things poorly. In terms of my sleep, I have no trouble falling asleep, but I find that um, when I wake up at two or three or four, and and I start thinking, um, my anxiety level, especially around you know all the the news prevents me from falling back to sleep. And then I often reach for my phone, which I know makes everything a hundred times worse. So what, what, what are some things I can do when I wake up at, in the middle of the night and can't fall back asleep? First, let's go to the daytime. I think sleep, insomnia is a 24 hour problem. It is not just a problem with your sleep. We tend to focus on that, but really part of the important solution is during the day. You just said you're watching, you know, the news is really creating a lot of anxiety. So corner that up, you know, put that in a box, right? So watch it just once or twice a day, right? You can do that in the morning, you can check that and check that in the late afternoon. Not a whole lot is going to change, you know, between, you know, when you get the White House briefings, you know, and when you go to bed, all right? So corner. So set time aside for that. It's what I call setting time aside for worrying. And now you're worried, set time aside for worrying at least three hours before you go to bed, right? So that you have a bedtime routine. It's very important. Take a warm bath. That's really great. And so have a routine that 
allows you to relax before you go to bed because you're taking all of that with you into bed. Now, you may still wake up at two or three in the morning because it's like three or it's like four hours after you're falling asleep or three hours after you're falling asleep because your drive for sleep, what we call the homeostat, is, is actually getting lowered. So what can you do? You should get out of bed and or at least sit up and do something that's relaxing. Don't go for your phone because you're probably going to watch the news again. Uh, don't go for your phone. Twitter. Listen. I go to Twitter. Twitter. And that can take a lot of time because you can follow a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you don't want anything that's going to keep your attention during that moment. You want to listen to music, prepare some books on tape, for example. It's a, it's a wonderful. So something that you're doing that is pleasurable, that is relaxing to you, and you're not thinking, oop, it's been half an hour and I still haven't been able to get back to sleep. I'm going to feel really bad tomorrow. That's the type of cognitive therapy that needs to kind of go. So I would just stay up uh, in dim light conditions and do these more, I would say, less um, exciting, you know, it, uh, exciting social media things. And, uh, and then when you, fall, when you feel sleepy again, which you will, then just slowly get back in bed and try to go back to sleep. Don't think very hard about trying. The harder you try to go to sleep, the more difficult it will be. And, and also, if you can't fall back to sleep, call it a day after 5 a.m. Just say, okay, I'm just going to be up. I'm going to feel pretty miserable, but I felt that way before already. And the next day, you're going to be able to fall asleep sooner and also your sleep will be more consolidated. So it's, so it's kind of a weird thing to say. I want you to sleep deprive yourself a little bit so that you can sleep better the next day and the day after and the day after. And that's what we're doing. Do you um, recommend any like melatonin or at what point is it beyond just normal sleep problems and, and veering into needing medication? Yeah, I think melatonin has its place, but uh, especially for those who have trouble falling asleep because they may have the circadian clock issue that we just talked about, where, you're, where you may be an evening type, a late person. If you're a very late person, melatonin can help you with your sleep. But if, uh, if the trouble is waking up in the middle of the night, I don't think that, that you know, melatonin may not help. It has a very, very short half-life. And high doses of melatonin can increase these vivid dreams that we were talking about. Um, so I, I generally, I don't think that would be necessarily uh, helpful to you, but the relaxation procedures uh, will be useful to you. Uh, you can have some chamomile tea. I think that would be useful uh, for you uh, as well, uh, you know, at this point. And of course, if it's chronic, and it's impairing your ability, your quality of life, and your ability to function during the day. You can't think straight, you're irritable, your mood is changing. Please then contact um, your, your, you know, your doctor. We are seeing patients, uh, even new patients, uh, remotely now via telemedicine. Yeah, and what, when they come to you, like, what's their biggest thing, that they can't fall asleep or they're waking up? What's typically the biggest complaint? When patients come to me, it's both, uh, both difficulty falling asleep. Usually those who have become more anxious, they have difficulty falling asleep. Uh, patients who may have more depressive symptoms also have trouble staying asleep. But oftentimes it's really both. It's really, it's really both. More commonly, I would say now is this uh, what Dana's experiencing, which is difficulty staying asleep. They wake up in the middle of the night and perhaps in a dream or perhaps not even in a dream and having difficulty uh, falling back to sleep because they can't shut down their mind. It's almost like you fell asleep with the news on. <laughs> and and now the news is coming right back and then you're you're really worried and there's so many things to worry about yeah so when you talked earlier about having that worry hour you know like get the worrying out before you go to bed i thought that was i haven't heard it put like that but if you actually set aside time to say i'm going to give myself i don't know what is it 10 minutes right to think about the things or put it down on paper and get rid of it because i i wonder you know and maybe you can tell like you know as you go about your day right for those of us who either have kids at home or we're tending to, you know, our work, you know, all day long. And so we don't 
have an opportunity to process, to your point, the bigger issues, like the fear of when is this going to end or will I lose my job or maybe you have lost your job, right? And so I think the way in which the brain works is it kind of like, okay, great. Now that I'm in bed, you're giving me the opportunity to process this stuff that you didn't really acknowledge throughout the day. And because of that, now it's like, uh-oh, you know, this seems to be more important than anything and I'm waking up. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I don't know if it, that's how it works. But. Even for, uh, this is a routine, a, a, what we ask our patients with insomnia to think about is really set aside worry time before, before bedtime. I would say about an hour, certainly not, you know, 10 minutes. That's probably too, too small to start thinking about the things that you're worrying about. Uh, and writing them down is, I think, really, really a, a great suggestion because you can say, well, I'm worried about this, but you can't solve that tonight anyways. But then you can, that allows you to plan for your day the next day as well. I'm going to tackle that tomorrow, for example. And how am I going to about doing that? And maybe a little problem solving as well. I'm worried about this. Here are some things I can do about that. And write it down. It'd be amazing how the next morning when you look at that and you, you will have a much brighter perspective because you will be well rested and you can now tackle some of those um, issues. It really does look, things look very different in the morning <laughs> than they do at night when, and, or certainly in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep. The, the worries are very different. Yeah. And even if you can't figure out how to make it better, right? Like for instance, you know, you're fearful of getting COVID or having someone you love, but you can maybe then add on something you're grateful about. But right now we're healthy, right? Or right now we're okay. Correct. To be grateful. And I do think that um, the, your social interactions, I, mean, I, I would boost those as, as much as one can within you know, the, the constraints that we have, but having social you know, girlfriend or boy, you know, friend and family parties, I, I think those have been really popular. And I just had one yesterday uh, to celebrate somebody's birthday and it was fantastic. I mean, even though you weren't seeing each other, it was just fantastic to connect with uh, folks. And I think that type of social structuring can also be very useful uh, for anxiety and of course for your sleep because it puts a smile on your face and, and you laugh with them. And I think that's so, um, so helpful for your, for your sleep. Yeah, I love that you connected the dots on that. You know what I mean? It's the socializing that lowers the anxiety and then in turn you feel better. So then you can have a better night's sleep. Right. And if you're afraid, let's say, am I going to get COVID or if I'm going to, you know, how safe it is. I've lost my job. Talking to other people, your friends, your family really does help. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, Dana, I don't know if you have any more questions for Dr. Z or if you feel you're going to take her advice. Like, what, what are you going to do? What, which, what did you hear that we are like, okay, I need to do this? So I'm going to put a journal next to my bed so that when I wake up, I have a place to write down the things that I'm spinning about. Um, and I'm going to try to be more mindful of turning my electronics off several hours before I go to bed and not, and I'm going to try to avoid the, the, habit of reaching for my phone when I can't sleep. Um, and those I, are my takeaways. <laughs> Thank you. And one more thing to yours is wake up in the morning. When you wake up in the morning, expose yourself to as much bright light as possible. Get your coffee next to the window. That light is a very powerful signal for your brain and for your sleep. I love that. Thank you. And I, I, I feel like I have to ask this question. I, I was going to wrap it up here, but I think it's important to um, Dr. Z. At what point should someone consider going on a prescription medication for sleep, right? You had said, if you're feeling a certain way, reach out. And then would that be part of the discussion? If, if the sleep problems are occurring more than three times uh, per night, per week, and it's chronic, meaning here, uh, we typically think if it's three months or more, that that becomes a chronic insomnia, you certainly should be reaching out to uh, your doctor or, or, or a uh, healthcare professional to discuss that. But I think that even 
a month or two months of this chronically and it's the 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 litmus test is how is it impacting your life your mood your health your worries your anxiety and i think speaking you know to your uh, physician would be a great first step even if you, they don't prescribe a a sleeping uh, or a, 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 a hypnotic medication because there are these behavioral and cognitive therapies that are really be first line. There's also um, online some cognitive behavior therapies for insomnia that you can all also try. Uh, and some of those are free, some of those uh, you pay a little bit, but they can be very useful. Some of the things that I just talked about are really part of uh, some of the elements of cognitive behavior therapy. There are web-based therapies like this um, as well. I would really try those first. Uh, cognitive behavior therapies and then medications is really a second line. Okay, so you're talking about like the apps that help you to meditate and learn mindfulness? No, no it's, it's really called cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. Oh. And it really talks about the sleep or the bedtime restriction therapy that we just talked about a little bit. It tells you about the cognitive, how do you wind, un unwind, I guess, your, your thoughts, the, the setting aside time uh, for worry, all of those are there. And there are lessons that you can follow. And, uh, and some of those actually give you feedback uh, as well. So I think it's something that you may want to just look into. I don't think they can be harmful. They can certainly be helpful. Yeah, we'll, we'll be sure to cover it on everydayhealth.com. We, we cover sleep quite a bit and its role in uh, helping people to stay healthy. Uh, so I want to thank you both for being here today. And for everybody who's watching, you can go to everydayhealth.com for more information. Mm -hmm.